one of the challenges of going last after a, a rich set of presentations is that everything that's worth saying has been said and the audience is tired. But I realized a few years ago that I had never had an original thought. I, I, had, never, I had never thought of something new and interesting save one thing in 10th grade in chemistry class. We had just learned about Avogadro's number and I turned to my friend and I said, let's call it avocado's number, the number of avocados in a guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's 6.2 times 10 to the 23rd right, molecules in a mole. Uh, but then, years later, I was horrified to find that in Trader Joe's, their avocado packets are called avocado's number, so not even that was original. <laughs> it's crushing. Uh, I want to begin with the recounting of a pastoral encounter that Father Antonio Sicari relates in a, an essay called The Family, A Place of Fraternity. In it, a wise and seasoned priest happens upon a young couple in the throes of passion. He stops, discreetly makes his presence known, and simply asks the couple what you were doing just now. What does it have to do with the stars? It is a masterstroke. The priest doesn't shriek in alarm or scold them or shame them. Rather, he invites them to think and to see their actions, their desires, their love in the broadest possible frame of reference in the context of the cosmos. In other words, to connect their life and their love with the very love that moves the stars. That wise priest, and I just learned actually that it was Jasani, that wise priest possessed a pastoral acumen very much in need today. Mainstream observers of the church's current crisis have lacked this capacious vision, interpreting the crisis narrowly as a problem of clericalism, of the discipline of celibacy, or of pedophilia, and so issuing corresponding calls for the establishment of lay review boards, married clergy, and more stringent child protection policies. None of these diagnoses or prescriptions is adequate. More careful, and I dare say more courageous observers, have identified homosexuality as a central factor in the crisis and have argued for more effective screening of seminarians. This is surely an important starting point, but it isn't sufficient. I'd like to suggest that the current crisis in the church is significantly an intellectual problem, a problem that is of ideas, the solution to which is a deep and broad education evinced by the priest above, by Jasani. This might seem at first glance a terribly remote assessment isn't it plain, after all, that the predators among the clergy were motivated by disordered desires? Isn't it clear that the problem is a moral problem, the, loose, the solution to which is a reformation of the will? Yes, it is that, but it is more than that, which is why a moral program will not suffice. Let me begin with a bit of speculation. If it is true, as it seems to be, that a man of high Episcopal status regularly committed grievously sinful acts just before celebrating the Mass. It's reasonable to suspect that he had lost any conviction about what the Mass is. Indeed, that he had lost any conviction about what he is. Multiply this situation a thousandfold with what seems to be a massive problem of active homosexual priests. And we have a grave crisis, spiritual and moral, yes, but also intellectual. I would like to focus on the latter. The problem is as old as man. When the serpent tempts Eve in the garden, he doesn't first induce her to set her will against God's. He's too subtle for that. Rather, he confuses her. His initial question, 
Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Deliberately obscures the truth, exaggerating the strictures that God had established, and also insinuating that God was somehow miserly with his uh, provisions. Eve partially resists this false formulation, but partly succumbs to it. She replies, we may, not, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve, too, has exaggerated God's restriction, unwittingly adopting the deceiver's distorted picture. She is now primed to accept a greater lie. You will not die, the serpent insists, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Genesis continues. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Her sight had been obscured. There are many dimensions of the current crisis that involve a failure to see. I will begin with one that underlies so many of the problems besetting us, not only homosexuality in the priesthood, but also transgenderism, the redefinition of marriage, even the widespread use of contraception. It is a failure to understand the significance of the body, in the culture at large, and alas, in the church as well, many have succumbed to the modern error that would locate personhood and moral agency in the non-material aspects of the self, reducing the body to a mere instrument of the will. In this view, as JP2 observed in Veritatis Splendor, the body is seen as a raw datum, devoid of any meaning and moral values, until freedom posits them. Therefore, as he says, human nature and the body appear as presuppositions or preambles materially necessary for freedom to make its choice, yet extrinsic to the person, the subject, and the human act. Once our sense of the body as intrinsic to personhood and the natural finalities of the body as normative from within the person, has been obscured. We are then primed to see the body and its structures as an infringement on our freedom in much the same way that Eve succumbed to the distorted picture in the garden. We perceive ourselves as subject to a heteronomy from below. Nature and freedom are thus alienated from each other and any moral dicta grounded on natural finalities seem likewise heteronymous somehow external impositions that constrain my freedom. It's interesting, folks, to think about this, this, the bizarre phenomenon of transgenderism and how a certain phrase has made its way into cultural parlance, which is so extraordinary to me, but how um, not only gender activists, but all manner of folks, uh, journalists and so forth, so casually deploy the phrase, a sex assigned at birth. That is such a curious formulation. So you're automatically, you're distancing the person and the body. Somehow this is a, it's a, a willed act. It's not a discovery. This, I would like to suggest, is the background intellectual condition out of which the current crisis arises. And it must be countered with a vigorous renewal of education within our homes, schools, parishes, universities, and seminaries. In its most basic aspect, we need to initiate the young into a vision of the world based upon several key tenets. Uh, none of these will be new to any students at the Institute. So I should probably be giving this lecture at Georgetown. <laughs> uh, my alma mater, by the way. Um, first, the world is a gift, and my existence is a gift. But the contingency of my life need not evoke anxiety and self-protection because I have been created out of love. 
this seems to me to be the bedrock principle of education. In Balthazar's profound formulation, each of us needs to become aware of what he calls the gracious favor that grants access and entry to the realm of being as a whole. This awareness, he explains, is joined to the primal experience, and I love this, this formulation, that one has arrived at participation in the world fellowship of beings by means of a summons coming from outside one's own eye. This summons is mediated humanly by a woman, the tenderness of the mother, whose warm embrace communicates the goodness and hospitable character of the world into which the child has been summoned, and whose smile evokes from him a recognition of his existence as a separate self, as a person. Importantly, Balthazar elaborates, the summons by the mother is not addressed to something in the child, a part of the child, but to the child itself, beyond the sum of its qualities, to the I of the child, who experiences at the same time that my I is loved, is lovable for my mother. So in short, I am good, I am lovable. What's more, the one who summons me, welcomes me, she too is good, and she represents the other, the world. The warmth and tenderness of this other elicits a profound existential response from me. In Balthazar's words, my reply can lie only in the gift of this I, together with all that may belong to it. I'd like to suggest that this is the beginning of an education to love. It starts at the breast and is nurtured in the sanctuary of the home. Charlotte Mason, an extraordinary 19th century British educator, coined an evocative phrase that well conveys the breadth of this education to love. She affirmed that education is an atmosphere, a discipline, a life. The atmosphere of the home is the means by which the child assimilates his first lessons. His mother and father are his primary teachers, for better or for worse says a homeschooling mother. <laughs> His curriculum concerns life's most profound truths and deepest mysteries revealed in the quotidian realities of domestic life. The child witnesses the steadfast fidelity and service of his father to his mother and vice versa. Husband and wife become thereby the first heralds of the gospel for their children, as JP2 puts it. Their sons and daughters are given an intimation of divine love, faithful, generous, self-diffusive. Building upon this experiential catechesis, parents further their educational mission by praying with their children, reading the scriptures to them, cultivating a liturgical rhythm in the home, observing the sacraments. This is an organic initiation into the life of the church. These lessons, the lessons of the home, are profoundly formative, teaching a child what it means to be human, what it means to be a Christian, and how to live in community. As JP2 observes, all the members of the family have a role to play in this, building up the communion of persons, making the family what he calls a school of deeper humanity. This happens very concretely, where there is care for the little ones, the sick, the aged, where there is mutual service rendered unto one another with courtesy every day, when there is a sharing of goods, of joys and sorrows. A child thus formed can enter the world equipped to serve and celebrate it. You might call what happens in a family in the way of education a kind of intimate pedagogy of a child's heart and soul which is very tenderly described by John Paul II. And this can only take place in the family because a mother and a father, sisters and brothers, bear a uniquely privileged relationship to him. The family alone is the domestic church and the primary school of love. But it doesn't do it alone. 
For one thing, it needs books, lots of them. And happily, thanks to Marushka Healy, I came to discover Value Village, where I buy nearly all of our books. These books should introduce the child, as Charlotte Mason would put it, to the great tradition to which he is heir. He needs to be introduced to that which will delight and stimulate him, quicken his spirit, whet his intellectual appetite, and inspire him. And so, Miss Mason urged, he needs to hear nursery rhymes, fables, nature lore, poetry, histories filled with the recounting of noble deeds. He needs to see beautiful art, to play out of doors, to train his mind and hands in craft making, and to encounter the natural world in all its splendor. In this vein, the great American educator, John Senior, observed, a child can't honestly admire the maker until he first honestly admires the things he made. It's an insult to ignore the artist's work while praising him on hearsay, as if by the invisible things of God, we come to know the visible things of earth. No, it's the other way around. Taste and see. This thing is good. It couldn't make itself. Therefore, we know he who made it is good. Senior says we're not metaphysical creatures, by which he means uh, simply spiritual creatures. We don't think like angels. Everything we know is known in things. And I think it's interesting. Um, Father Griffin, I don't think, is here anymore. But John Senior's program, now legendary, at the University of Kansas, took students where they were. It didn't presuppose a profound education. So we're talking about freshmen at a, a massive state school in the Midwest. It took the students where they were. You can imagine appropriating this in a seminary now. Um, and it exposed to them the real. They were, they were encouraged to encounter the real. The motto of the Integrated Humanities Program at, at KU was, let them be born in wonder. How was this accomplished? Well, it was accomplished through the reading of the great books. But it was also accomplished through hearing beautiful music, poetry, um, through dance instruction, uh, learning traditional dances, and through uh, handicrafts like calligraphy and stargazing. Freshmen were required to, uh, to go out beyond the city limits and to lie down in the fields in Kansas, so in the prairie, and look up at the stars. They were required to stargaze, while an older student would identify the constellations and would recount the great Greek myths relating to those. Uh, I'm re reading right now a book by Father Francis Bethel, a monk of Clear, Ke Clear Creek Abbey. And in the introduction, he says that there are roughly 200 people who have come forward to say that because of John Sr. and the work of the Integrated Humanities Program, they were drawn to the church. And that program, it's, it's fascinating to me, it was not explicitly evangelical, and it was certainly not catechetical, but it was an exposure to the real, to what's beautiful, and that drew these people, along with scores of, of folks who returned to the church. All of the educational endeavors I mentioned above <laughs> each in its own way, will teach the child that he is good, the world is good, and finally, that God is good. They will also teach him that sin and evil exist, that life constitutes a great drama in which he is a participant, and that the way of truth, beauty, and goodness will entail suffering. As he matures, his education will take on philosophical and theological depth, so that he might understand those things he already loves, understand what they are in themselves and in relation to other things. So although his education will penetrate individual subjects more deeply, it will always retain breadth and variety, offering him what Newman called a connected view of things. 
A child and young person formed in this way will come to see the world aright and to know that he inhabits an order he did not make. He will also perceive, and this is crucial, a beneficence behind this order, that it is somehow for him and not against him. Apropos of today's theme, he will know that men and women are different and are ordained for each other. The complementarity of their bodies and the sexual embrace conveying a holy mystery for which he has reverence. In light of this, he will hopefully gain the conviction that to act against this design in any of the ways noted at the outset of this paper is to rupture his communion with the cosmos and with the microcosm of his own self. For the same divine intelligence that established the stars in the firmament and set the heavenly bodies in motion also knit him in his mother's womb. Behind the moral and cosmological orders lies a great unity, a fact evident even to a modern rationalist like Kant. Two things, Kant noted, fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the more often and steadily we reflect upon them. Think about John Senior's students out in the Kansas prairie. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. I do not seek or conjecture either of them as if they were veiled obscurities or extravagances beyond the horizon of my vision. I see them before me and connect them immediately with the consciousness of my existence. One can imagine that if the actors at the center of the church's current crisis had interiorized deeply this vision of things, they would have sensed within themselves the need for profound healing and would have sought it, confident that somehow the very order of things was their strong ally. In closing, let me say that we too can take solace in the order of things amidst so much disorder and darkness. And in the spirit of John Senior, who knew much about educating to love, let me take recourse to the poetic mode and share with you a poem by Wendell Berry. The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Thank you. <laughs>